just yeah. no peace. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not good. Uh, why? Yeah, what happened after you left? Uh, after you exposed yourself that you are a, an open critic, what happened to you? I had to leave where I was living in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They started in with the surveillance, the private investigators, and then they threatened to sue me in Minneapolis for violating an agreement that I had signed with them when I left to never speak against them. So I left Minnesota because there was no way I could legally defend myself there because there's no public awareness of Scientology. It would be a matter of reinventing the wheel and at great expense to remain in Minnesota. So I filed a lawsuit against them in Riverside, California. And uh, I was going to move to California, but it proved to be too dangerous. To so, yeah, hmm. for me to live there. So you, so you decided to go to Colorado? To Colorado. Yeah. But I hid out in Puget Sound for a while, and up with Bob in New Hampshire for a while, mm. many weeks. Yeah. Well, that's a hard time. Mm. Um, you thought uh, with, uh, so, but do you think we should put off the, uh, the, I turned it off. No, I put it on. Oh, you put it on? Inside, yeah. Oh, I thought yeah. I turned it off again. No, no. no. <laughs> Is it or, on? Or the intelligence, or both, or oh. any city. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's off now. So now it's off, yeah. Um, <coughs> you had been um, during your time in Scientology, uh, at one time the uh, second highest Scientology officer worldwide? Yes. And what was your job in which you worked for? Um, I had a dual position as far as being an executive in Scientology. I was um, on the board of directors of the Religious Technology Center as a treasurer. And my official uh, ecclesiastical post title was called Deputy Inspector General for External RTC, which meant that I um, supervised the external activities of an organization as opposed to the person that orders the, the paper and makes sure that ink pens are there and paper clips and things like that. So the areas of Scientology that I uh, supervised, and I had other supervisors that helped me supervise them, was the legal uh, department of Scientology, which was all the legal cases, um, the investigative uh, intelligence network, um, also the network that would get pre-clear files from all the organization and supervise to see how the organizations were, were doing as well. And then trademarks. So, and, and also uh, Scientology's computer network, INCOM. I was uh, the senior supervisor of Scientology's computerization. And that means um, as head of the RTC? Uh, Author, you know, AVC as well, well, Authority Verifications and Corrections Unit, which is the uh, section in the RTC, which was uh, under RTC, that gives issue authority to all of the issues that are published within Scientology. And how would you describe RTC and how important is this the, is this the head of Scientology? <laughs> well, it, at the time it was ecclesi the ecclesiastical or the, um, the apparent ecclesiastical uh, head of all of Scientology. And who is the boss within Scientology? Excuse me? Who is the boss, the chief? Oh, David Miscavige. He, he was in a for-profit corporation, and he, you, you know, the, the, these are corporate shams in reality. Um, the chain of command was quite different than what it, what it appeared to be or what it was supposed to be. And is Miscavige the only one who is controlling Scientology? Is he the dictator? Well, yes, he is the dictator, but he is, he is that because of lawyers that he personally hired and to set up the different Scientology corporations whereby he's a he's the trustee of all the major corporations which is a more senior position than a director and um, also his lawyers which he pays are also on the board of some of the Scientology corporations and standard practice with, within Scientology to 
when you get into a position like that to sign an undated resignation in case you should ever fall short of the ideals or <laughs> fail to comply with what you're directed to do within Scientology. Mm -hmm. So that means that RTC and you want to be heads of RTC, that RTC is controlling all entities of Scientology worldwide. Exactly. And all the money ends up, which comes from every org and every, from everywhere, it ends up on an account of RTC. Well, no, 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 no. The, all the money would uh, go to uh, Church of Scientology International, who, who would then get it to an account that they had in Liechtenstein and also in Cyprus so that it wouldn't be under the control or auspices of the United States government. Mm -hmm. And who's controlling the accounts in Liechtenstein and Cypern? Um, well, David Miscavige was one. Um, a girl, Maureen Bergatti, who is in the UK, would bring the money from the UK to the US or vice versa, take it from the United States, cash certified checks or whatever and um, take it from the U.S. to the U.K. to then put it in foreign accounts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Mark Yeager was also another person who has since left the Church of Scientology that would directly channel the funds. The person that does that currently within the church, is, his name is Mark Ingber. And he's the commanding officer, I believe he's the commanding officer of the Commodore's Messenger Organization and the Church of Scientology International organization. Mm -hmm. And um, how much money do you think is on that account? So has been summed up. At one time, um, a count was done of money that uh, couldn't be hidden. There was more money, but as far as money that couldn't be hidden in assets, it was in excess of $400 million. And this was as of. Um, I have to say 1985. Of course, I'm sure it's considerably more. I, it, it is my belief that they have a billion or more dollars today. Today? Yeah. And uh, mainly controlled by David Miscavige? Yes. Are they and attorneys. Are they reinvesting the money again, or is it only like an um, interest account? Well, no, they have. Uh, as of late, I've come to learn that they majorly work with investments in the stock industry, doing uh, s stocks and investments, which is what's doubling the money faster. So they don't use their good money for doing other projects or uh, oh, projects or like investigating things? Oh, yes, they use, they use uh, well, I think David Miscavige admitted himself that they spent over a million dollars in legal fees a month mm -hmm. uh, when they were attempting to get their IRS tax exempt status. And of course those legal fees went to attorneys but a good portion of it also went to investigators because they went and investigated every person in the IRS that was denying the, their 5013C tax exempt status and personally uh, sued each person as well as hired investigators to investigate them and create calamity in their lives. How would you describe um, the personality or the character of David Miscavige? Um, you know, it's kind of sad. It's, it's, it's the tale of a madman. David Miscavige's father, Ron Miscavige, was a manic depressive. He would have his highs and he would have his lows. And he was a very explosive kind of personality. You know, he screams, rants and raves, throws things around. So I can only imagine that this is how David Miscavige was brought up as a child. Then, at being a second generation Scientologist, now he goes to St. Hill and works with L. Ron Hubbard, who has a very similar character and temperament as his father, but much worse and more paranoid. So this is how he was raised. So therefore, he, he, he is or became his environment. And he himself is, has quite an explosive temper and... Uh, very irrational, can be very irrational at times. Yeah. And, and, and the, uh, demeaning, you know, he, he also seems to take a perverse um, pleasure in 
m you know, making women cry, making people feel bad. I'm sure Stacy told you the story of him making a staff member push a pencil with his nose down a hallway with his hands behind his back. Um, I, I've, I've seen him um, where he gets upset with a staff member or, or an executive, have other people on each side of the person holding them while he spits in their face, slaps them, kicks them, this kind of thing. Because he's, he's actually quite a short person himself. And he's very paranoid because, I believe, of what he does, that he feels that someone's going to hurt him, so he has to hurt them first. Security with him always? Always armed guards, yes. Armed guards? Yes, armed guards, always. At Gold? Oh, no, not at Gold. He has, you know, security people that. But, you know, in, in that environment at Gold where he is, he feels pretty safe because the, the people that are there deify him, you know, as uh, the new uh, head of the Church of Scientology. How is this Gold system organized? Is it all, uh, normally they are saying, or they are saying this is only a film studio. There's nothing more. There's no headquarters. There's nothing. But what is really at the Golden? Uh, the International Management of Scientology. Th that is the area, uh, CSI, Church of Scientology International, which operates and micromanages all of its other corporations, such as uh, Flag Service Organization here in Clearwater, where we are, is micromanaged from the CSI Corporation at Gilman, at Gilman Hot Springs. Um, the, the facility that they have in Los Angeles is micromanaged by the facility in Gilman. The facility that they have in Europe is micromanaged by the facility that they have in Gilman Hot Springs. In other words, any area that produces a sufficient amount of income is micromanaged from the Gilman Hot Springs location. So it means the location there is the real world headquarters of Scientology? Yes. And David Discovered is living there also? Yes, yes, he does. Yes. How would you describe his living conditions? Very elaborate, very lavish that I've seen, you know, and, and y you, you see that some of the buildings that they have are actually quite nice. They, they look quite nice. Some of the properties are quite nice. Yeah, luxury, so. Very luxurious, as a matter of fact, is a good word. Reason being is, is they have zero cost for labor. It's simply material cost because they have the, their, their slave camp, they have their slave laborers that work night and day. And then when, even when the slave laborers can't keep up with it, there's a day, uh, Saturday, where every person at Gilman Hot Springs, no matter what position you're in, goes and does the labor just like the slaves does all day doing renovations. So in that wise, you know, if you have no labor costs and just materials, you can accomplish quite a bit. And everybody has to work on Saturdays? Yes, everyone. Every Sea Org member. Every Sea Org member. Yeah. 600 are living there, right? Yes. Did and you then, too? Yes, I did it too, yes. So did it too? Yes. This, that means it's a, it's a big slave camp. And utterly, totally, and completely. But everything only for the benefit of David Discovery. Well, Maybe. by his will. Not necessarily for his benefit, but you know, if he decides that something needs to look a certain way, well, then that's how it looks. If he decides that things need to be done in a certain way, then that's how they are done. Is it, it is by his will. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the secret with the Golden Compound with at Gilman Hot Springs? What is so secretive that they are so um, try to hide it for the public and for everyone? Why are they not open? Well, originally it goes back to, I guess, 1977 or even earlier, where the Guardian's Office which is the investigative and legal unit, the old investigative and legal unit of, the, of Scientology, had a program called Snow White where they were ordered to purge the files of any government agency or any private industry of uh, allegations against L. Ron Hubbard to make it safe for him to come out. And that Golden Air Productions in, in Gilman was the place where L. Ron Hubbard himself was supposed to live. So you know, that's why they kept it a secret. But L. Ron Hubbard lived here in Clearwater in 76 in, in Dunedin, a suburb of Clearwater, and he lived here. And the whole intention was, and, and he was on the run because he was, you know, subpoenaed and the courts were looking for him, and he couldn't really have just one location. But that program, and then even through the, uh, the probate in 1984, when his son, L. Ron Hubbard, Jr., tried to sue the church because they said he was claimed his father was mentally incompetent 
and Miscavige in the current regime of which at that time I was a part of was uh, taking his money and you know profiting from what he had done with his books and everything else and they made it so <clears throat> that at that time David Miscavige realized I'm pretty sure through advice of attorneys that if he could sufficiently keep L. Ron Hubbard away then it would all come to him. L. Ron Hubbard had a different idea and I, I remember this story quite vividly because L. Ron Hubbard sent something to me and said David Miscavige is trying to work it out so that I can have nothing to do with Scientology anymore and I created it and it's all going to him. Uh, his top aides, Pat Broker and Annie Broker, now Annie Broker was supposed to be the head of RTC. She was supposed to be the Inspector General. I was a Deputy Inspector General. Vicki Azaran was a Deputy Inspector General, but Annie Broker was the Inspector General. David Miscavige at that point told them, no, you can't be that. You can't have any connection with the church. Told L. Ron Hubbard he couldn't have any connection with the church. So L. Ron Hubbard sent something to me and asked me to uh, do a security check on on David Miscavige, find out what's going on with him because he's arranging it so that I can't do nothing. And I sat with David Miscavige and watched him cry because he thought he was going to the RPF. He knew he was a dead duck. So he started telling me things um, to get other people in trouble, such as Pat Broker at the time, whereby they were, uh, Mark Yeager, this, the then CO, CMO International, would take they, they would order money from all the orgs, from the FSO, from the, uh, the PAC orgs, and have cash, millions of dollars in suitcases. Mark Yeager would pack these suitcases with this money. And because L. Ron Hubbard made sure he got his money, if he couldn't control the church, he would still make sure he got the money. And they would take the suitcase and they would meet in little secret locations, but they would end up in Vegas taking the money, gambling, drunk, having a good time, and he told me these things when I'm f trying to find out information for Ron Hubbard to see wha what is happening so that he doesn't have Did control. Spend the money gambling. Him and Pat Broker yeah. spend a portion of it. Part. Of, I mean, you can't spend millions at a casino in a matter of days. I guess you could, but I don't. I don't yeah, think. Miscavige is a gambler, although has been. Yeah, gambler. Yeah. As well as uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard's doctor, Doctor Dink, who made sure that he Dink. killed him. He's gambling too in Vegas, but. Um, but Scavage started telling me these things that he knew would get Pat Broker in trouble, who was the person that was to succeed uh, um, Miscavige, because Pat Broker is now trying to get Miscavige out the way. Oh, but now Miscavige starts talking about things that he and, uh, that he and um, Pat Broker have done together, which L. Ron Hubbard would be extremely upset about. So this report, after I found out this information, I'm quite sure it never made it to L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard. It was just like, oh my God, now everybody's in trouble. So, you know, at, at which point L. Ron Hubbard from 19, uh, mid 85 to the time of his death in 86, literally had no contact with Scientology senior management. Whereas before, he himself also micromanaged every day. He would talk into a dictaphone with orders for every organization, for RTC, for Church of Scientology International, for the Executive Directive International, for the Flag Service Organization, micromanaging, you know, with the, with the recorder and then goes to the unit and then it's translated and then the messengers come around with dispatches from L. Ron Hubbard and he, you know, kept an army of people busy doing an insane and silly things in it. At which point, as I sat there seeing this happen because People that are lower in Scientology never realize this goes on. I mean, you read their policies and they have these high goals and all of this, and you really think you're doing some good. But in fact, when you get to these high levels, you see the insanity of it. And I, that's what started me to become disaffected with the whole thing, because I knew at that point, number one, this has nothing to do with religion. It's a money-making scam scene. Certain people, as long as you're compliant, you, you get a lot of things like I had a lot of nice clothes, suits made for me, and, you know, limousine, first class here, there, everywhere, you know, slaves doing my laundry, cleaning my room, doing everything. I didn't have to do anything. And I, I myself started to feel very empty about these things because of the divide. 
And um, I started to, you know, become disaffected with and disillusioned by the whole movement. And then this schism happened between, and then the thing with Pat Broker and, and David Miscavige escalated after L. Ron Hubbard died. But uh, Miscavige had carefully, very carefully, by working with attorneys, set up corporations that Pat and Annie Broker could not be, a, were not a part of, were not the directors, were not the trustees, no corporate control whatsoever. So they could not possibly come in after L. Ron Hubbard died and say they're the new leaders. He kicked them out. David Miscavige. David Miscavige. Let's go. Yes. For what reason? Because I wouldn't go along with his plan to get rid of Pat and Annie Broker, and um, I refuse to do it. I refuse to uh, be a part of it. I, I refuse to have anything to do with it. So he said, okay, I'm going to have to get you too. And how, how are you saying this to you? You're saying, yeah. Yeah. you have to go now to the RPM? Yes. I, I will RPM. Well, you know, there was a lot of people in the room. They woke me up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, they loved this element of surprise. And by the time I had come to the room, they had already gotten Vicki Azaran, who was supposed to be, quote, unquote, the number one person in all of Scientology. And she was sitting in the corner crying and shaking miserably because they, you know, all of these men had screamed at her, pushed her around, and, and she was very afraid. And then I came in the room, and he says, well, it's over now. You had a chance. You made the wrong choice. And you're going to the RPF. And, uh, and he he told me, you call me sir. I'll, I'll never forget it. And I looked at him. I was sitting across the desk. He said, say it, say it, say it. And I got up and I said, fuck you. And I walked out of the room, at which point people tried to grab me. But I had karate training, and I knocked them together, and they backed off, at which point I ran to my room and got a rifle, uh, a semi-automatic uh, rifle that I had gotten from L. Ron Hubbard because everyone had rifles, semi-automatic, fully automatic rifles, and a 45. And I came back and I said, what do you want to do now? <laughs> the office of Miss Cavage. Yeah. The office. Yeah. I ran to my room because my bedroom was I don't, I don't, not very far. I don't know, like maybe 10, uh, uh, 20 yards away from his office because we all lived his close. His office is near the ship? This is then. Now, you know. I was it then? Yeah, I'm explaining to you, yeah, near the ship. There's the ship, then there was all of our bedrooms up on the hill. Miscavige's bedroom was here. Mark Yeager's bedroom was here. The apartments. Yeah, the little apartments, yeah. And then mine was here. I was in the same complex as his. You see them from the street? Yes, the yeah. There's grapevines over, and you can see this. So that's where I live. And then even further up in that row of apartments was his office. Yeah. Yeah. We all did. His wife. Yeah. And you also on that ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all did. So you came back to his office with a rifle in the hand. Yeah. And then what you told him? And and I said, what do you want to do now? We've leveled the playing field because there were so many of them and just one of me. Mm -hmm. And then um, he said, well, you know, we have guns too. I said, yeah, but you will be the first to die if I shoot. <laughs> so it was pretty intense. And then, you know, I kind of felt kind of bad because everything was crumbling around me as well, and everyone is now against me. So now David totally changes character. He says, Jesse, you know, we've been through so much. You know, please, let's not do this. Come on, put the guns away. I, I, I. Put the guns away. He didn't take my guns. I put them back, and then I came out, and we talked, and he said to me at that point, he says, look, I really need you to do this. You know, please just take this fall because... You know, you're, you're in a high position in the church. All of the staff see this going on. I need you to do this just so Scientology itself doesn't fall apart. And if you do this, then I will come and take you and, and, and put you back in a position. And, you know, I didn't really care about that. And at the time, I didn't think that it would be a good idea for all of Scientology to fall apart because I'm still not straight in my head yet. So I conceded. I signed my undated, res uh, uh, he already had an undated resignation that I signed already, so that was in effect. I was kicked off the board of RTC, and I was put in RPF. And where's the RPF? It was in Happy Valley at the time. And uh, Happy Valley is where? It's only 
Uh, yeah, just down the road from uh, Gilman Hot Springs, their Golden Arrow location on the Indian, 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 Indian Reservation. Reservation. Yeah, just past through the Suburban Indian Reservation. That boy drove you down by, by a van? Or? Yeah, they took me down there. Alone? Oh, no, I was with Vicki Azaran because she went and several other people in RTC because they all went. And um, at which point he started restructuring once again all of Scientology, all of the... Uh, Senior executives in Scientology. Which year was this? This was 1987. 1987. Yes. So you have, he still came aside by David Bishop Davis personally to the RPA at Happy Valley? Yes. And you arrived there during the day? It was How in. How it Was there somebody opening the guard doors? It's like a prison camp? Yeah, it totally. It, it's a complete and other and total prison camp. You're stripped of everything. You're made to work doing uh, menial labor tasks, uh, like digging in the ground to lay. Uh, gas pipes and, and sewage pipes for the new construction which eventually became the facility for the children and just working doing that labor plus being transported on the bus every day back to Gilman Hot Springs to work on renovation projects there. So you had your black clothes, your, your yeah, clothes black, clothes black prison clothes, the whole thing. And you started uh, at the lowest place with no band? Or right, band? No, no band. No band. No band. How long did it take for you to get your white band? Well, the, what happened is, is I was there when I first arrived. And now David Miscavige is really telling everybody at uh, Golden Era, oh, Jesse, he's a real bad shit, and he did this, and he did that, which was not what we spoke about. And um, I said, OK. Then also, I was auditing Vicky because she was so upset. I mean, she almost almost having an episode. She was like, there. no, no, no. She was just there. Mm -hmm. She was on the brink of having one of these episodes, these psychotic episodes, like Lisa McPherson. So you know, and we were friends. So I'm trying to comfort her, and I'm and then I audited her, and she said something in her auditing about Pat Broker getting his own lawyers and coming back to fight Scientology after this happened. And that went to David Miscavige. And the next thing you know now, another person, Jeff Walker, comes out and he's out of the counseling session raking Vicky over the coals about this. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I wrote in Vicky's folder and I says, look, you're not living up to anything that you say you do. You're just a little lying, you know. And I'm, well, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to the press. And we're going to try this and see what this is all about. If I don't hear from you by noon, I'm going to do this. Well, of course, at noon the next day comes, I hear nothing, out the gate I go. <clears throat> and I take another person with me, um, David Bush, at Spike Happy Bush. Valley. Yeah, at Happy he Valley. Walked to the gate. Walked, told the security guard. The watchtower there also, yeah. at the entrance. Yeah. They couldn't stop me, though. And the watchtower, was it, there's a man sitting, guard, yeah. with the rifle, rifle, or? Uh, rifle? No, he just had the batons, the mace, and the walkie-talkie. Mm -hmm. And so he, he told me to stop. Inside the booth. Inside the booth. Yeah. At the watchtower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me to stop, and I said, no, I'm not going to stop, and if you come down here, you're going to be sorry. So I run to the road, and some Indians just happened to be coming by. And we said, hey, help us to escape, because these people, you know, they're holding us in here. We can't get away. But so that's, th that's one mile. Yeah. From the entrance to, to the, the road. To the road. Right. Right, the dirt road up, yeah, yeah. The and they followed you with the motorcycles? With motorcycles. And then also now at Gilman Hot Springs, all their security and all of their people are ra racing down the road to get me. But, but these Indians got me and first. first, and they put me in a truck. So I'm driving, and then they're coming, and the Indians told them, we got guns too, and if you do something here, you're going to be real sorry. So they took us to, they had a casino there, um, and, and then they said, well, we're calling the police. Well, now I'm so frightened because I don't know what to do, so I'm running away from the Indians too now. So I'm running away from the Indians, I'm running away from the Scientologists, I'm running away from the police. Finally, I'm going now on that road to Hemet. I'm going to just want to go make some phone calls. I got my credit card with me, I have some money. And then here comes Ray Midoff from RTC. Come on, let us at least give you a ride in the town. Let's talk about this. So I said, first thing I want to do is get mobile. You drive me to a place where I can rent a car, then we'll talk. So they did that. Then they arranged a hotel at the Best Western. 
Now, Vicky was still back there. They had her locked in a room. She's sick, you know, yeah. in Happy Valley. Happy Valley. Yeah. And I went and rented this big car, a Lincoln or something. Oh, you want to free her? Free her. So I got the car and told them I was going to meet them at a certain place, and they went there. But instead, I go back to Happy Valley, woo, with the car, and grab some things that were mine. And I tell Vicky, you come now. And she sat there. I'll never believe it. She sat there. She was like, ah. Uh, I said, you come. They were telling her, no, don't go, don't go. Come. Finally, she got up. I put her in the car. Her, me, and Spike, zoom back out of there. And they are really hating me now. You know, they think this is just horrible. And um, so Vicky and, and us, they, we stayed in the room where, you know, in town at the Best Western. And we were all going to leave. I called it LA Times. I was going to give them a story, tell them the whole thing. But then they did something that I never suspected, which was they, um, my wife. I was married then. I think I had been married maybe four or five years. And um, they, they, they convinced my wife not to go with me. And I knew that she didn't understand what was going on. And I couldn't conceive of leaving her there. So Vicky and Rick left. And I went back, oh, for five years. It took five years for her to come to herself. And the only reason that happened was because they had forced her to have an abortion. And this broke her spirit. And then she was ready to go. So the black man you push her? Yeah. Or vice versa? Yeah. Okay, so it's painful. 